Hi, this is Eric Smith. Time to do another video in my series of videos about cliched expressions that Christians shouldn't use. And uh, this is my 12th video. And like the videos before it, I just want to go over how I'm going to examine this cliched expression. So first, I'm going to tell you what the cliched expression is. I'm going to give you uh, what that cl cliched expression is. I'm going to give you the reason that cliched expression is normally used. And then I'm going to give you what the people that are giving that biblical, uh, that cliched expression would think is the biblical justification for it. And then I'm going to give you the biblical truth behind that cliched expression. And today's cliched expression is actually one that I, I honestly don't disagree with, but the way it's used and the reason it's used, I do disagree with. So this cliched expression is, the church is not a building. Now that is absolutely true. And the Greek word for church is ekklesia. And that actually means the called out ones. God gives us an effectual call through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And sinners repent and believe. They are believers and they're the called out ones. So there is a universal church of believers all over the world throughout the centuries. That is absolutely true. So in that respect, the church is not a building. But the majority of time, the reason this, ex this expression is used is because someone either doesn't want to be a member of a local church congregation or they dislike the structure of the organized church. So going to a church building with a church name isn't really the true church in the mind of the people that feel this way. So nine times out of 10, when someone says the church isn't a building, this is the, the thinking behind it. They don't want to go to a church that has a church name. So if it says First Baptist Church and it's a building, all of a sudden they're against it. Uh, if there is a structure, an organization about it, they think that that's wrong. So they have a reason to say what they're saying, and that's the main reason. Well, let me give you the biblical justification for that, because they would say, like I would say, that the universal church is the church of believers all over the world. And these verses will back that up. Um, Colossians 1.18. If you read Colossians 1.15 through uh, 19, or 20 actually, it talks about Christ. And in verse 18, it says about Christ, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. So you notice that the church is the body of Christ. It's believers all over the world. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you're in Christ, you're part of his body. Uh, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 22 and 23. And again, this is talking about Christ. And it says, And he hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So again, we have another verse that says that the church is the body. That's exactly what the church is. It's the universal body of believers all over the world. And then Romans 12, 5. I just want to read that quickly. And Romans 12, 5 says this. So we, being many, are one body in Christ and everyone members of another. Again, these Bible verses are saying clearly that we are the body of Christ. So we, we, we clearly have verses that tell us Christ, that Christians, excuse me, are the body of Christ, the universal church. So calling a building a church or having the organized structure is incorrect in the minds of a lot of people, right? Well, actually, this is not right. It's wrong. An argument against a church building and an organized structure is actually refuted in Scripture. It really is. In fact, Scripture actually presupposes that there, that there should be a church building and there should be an organized structure. 
And we're going to see that as we delve into the biblical truth of this particular cliched expression. So let's look at three biblical facts concerning the body of Christ, the church. So first I want to turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And uh, these are probably familiar verses. I'm going to read verses 23 through 25. It says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Notice in these verses, we shouldn't forsake the assembling or gathering of ourselves together. We do it for corporate worship, we do it for biblical edification, and we do it for joyful fellowship. So the body of Christ needs to what? Gather together. We need to assemble with one another. We need to be together. There's no such thing as a lone wolf Christian. There's no such thing as a rogue Christian. We are to help one another in our sanctified walk. And how we do that is we make sure we gather together. So here's the second thing. I want to read uh, Philemon. And I want to read verses 1 and 2. It says, Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, unto Philemon, our dear beloved and fellow laborer, and to our beloved Aphia and Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in thy house. Do you notice that Paul, when he's greeting Philemon in uh, the first two verses of this short epistle, he says he has a church in his house. So the church is inside a structure. I want to read something else to you too. I want to go to Romans chapter 16. And I want to read uh, verses 3 through 5. And again, this is Paul, and this is the end of the epistle to the Romans. So Paul is giving some greetings. So it says in verse 3, Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epenetus, who is the first fruits of, Arche of Achaia unto Christ. I may be mispronouncing that um, uh, the name in that city so or that person, so I apologize. But notice in verse 15, it says, Greet the church that is in their house. And when you go to 1 Corinthians 6.19, when it talks about uh, Aquila and Priscilla, again, it mentions that they have a church in their house. There is nothing sinful about gathering in a building. Now, I want to say something really quick. <laughs> a lot of times people will say a house is not the same as a church building. So they want to differentiate between having a church in a house or an apartment as opposed to an actual building that you build and you call a church. Well, you know what? That's semantics because whether it's a big building a house or even an apartment it's still a building and it would be better to gather inside a building now are there places in the world where Christians may be gathering in places outside because they have no other place to gather could they be gathering in a field could they be gathering in a cave yes that's absolutely true there may be really severe persecution in places and that's what they have to do but notice the Bible never says gathering inside a building is bad and the building doesn't necessarily have to be a house for people that want to get caught up in the house church movement just because i read these scriptures does not mean that the church can't be in another building so if you want to build a building specifically for the gathering of christians that's actually a good thing because let me tell you something if you have a house church and you got a lot of members Depending on how big your house is, you're going to need a bigger structure. So there's nothing wrong with having a big building. The third thing I want to talk about is these set of verses that talk about the offices that the Bible tells us is important to a church congregation. 1 Timothy 3, 1-13, 1 
Titus 1, 6 through 9, 2 Timothy 4, 2, Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, and 1 Peter 5, 1 through 3 shows us the structure of the church. It, it absolutely does. There are offices, and those are elders and deacons. We wouldn't have elders and deacons. We wouldn't have offices unless it was organized. There are duties, and the duties are to preach the word for growth, edification, and even protection against false teachers. You particularly will see that in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. You have qualified elders, teachers that teach the word of God for the edifying for the body of Christ and to equip them for ministry. Okay? There are also sacraments as well. Uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 34 has instructions about the Lord's Supper. When we uh, do the Lord's Supper, normally we read from those verses. And the book of Acts records believers' baptism because believers in Jesus Christ need to be baptized. Again, you can't baptize yourself. I saw a video one time <laughs> where someone was being baptized virtually. I don't know how you do that. I guess the person is on a video screen and then the person gets baptized in a tub. Either they do it themselves or someone else does it. Listen, that's not church. Online stuff is not church. Bible studies are not church. Gathering together for family devotion is not church. Now, all those things are not bad. In fact, I have family devotions in my home. I go to Bible studies. Um, I go to prayer meetings. There's nothing wrong with that. Those things can be done outside the organized structure of a church. But a church needs to be organized and it needs to be structured. So we have examples here that, that God has a structure for his church. It is to be organized and God isn't opposed to a building for church congregations. In fact, let's read 1 Corinthians 14.33. That chapter is talking about tongues. So that's the context. And it's talking about how tongues are misused. And uh, there's a structure for using tongues in the church. And that's why chapter 14 is really long. But chapter 14, verse 33, says something important that not only pertains to tongues and prophecies and things that are going on in the church, but about the church as a whole. And verse 33 says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. So God does not want a disorganized church. God doesn't want Christians just going, Oh, you know what? I'm in the universal body of Christ, so, uh, Christ, so I don't need to be under an elder. Or um, I don't need to come and worship in a building. Because how are you going to do corporate worship of singing and doing all those things? I mean, unless you're doing it out in the field somewhere. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. But you have to have some place to gather. There's nothing wrong with going to a building to gather and having it organized. Because there's different administrations in church. Now, I know people will hear this. And the first thing that may pop into their heads is all the complaints they have about churches. Like, you know, denominations. You know, uh, why do we have different denominations? Now, sometimes denominations can actually fall in the realm of 1 Corinthians 1, 12 through 13, where it talks about factions and people being divided. Listen, that could happen, and that's not right. But by and large, most denominations may have differences in certain doctrine, but you know what? They're unified on the fundamentals of the faith. And if they're unified on the fundamentals of the faith, they can work out those differences in doctrines with an open Bible and a prayerful heart. Also, I know some people might say, well, I went to this church and they're just false teachers and, you know, um, they swindled me out of money and there's all this stuff going on, there's scandal, there's sexual immorality. Listen, the Bible does not promote any of those things. It doesn't put a stamp of approval on any of those things. And if you're a good Berean, Acts 17, 11, and you check everything against the Word of God, and you see that there's false teaching, you see that there's sexual immorality, you see that there's just wickedness and greediness and things like that, then it's fine to leave that church. Because that's not the church of Christ. That's not the organized church of Christ preaching and teaching the Word of God for your edification and your growth. That's 
you know, scandalous stuff. That's false teachers. That's people, you know, wanting to just scam you out of your money and, and, and really have you following after them. These are heretics. That's not the same as going to a good Bible-believing church that follows the doctrines of Christ. The third thing, people might say, well, I can't find a church in my area. Listen, that is difficult sometimes. Sometimes the closest church may be a long drive. You know what? You may have to gut that out and do that. Because church is worth it. Because you don't want to be alone. You can't do online church. Because a pastor can't look after you. He can't be a shepherd to you if he doesn't see you. And you, if you have a big church and you have a bunch of elders, then you at least you have elders and deacons that can what? Check on you. Watch over you. Pray. And also correct you. If you're not in a church congregation, you can't do any of those things. So we have to understand something. We make excuses not to gather together in a building because we don't like organized church. But the Bible presupposes it. And yes, we are the universal church. And that's absolutely true. But being in a church congregation is completely biblical. And to deny that you need to be in one actually speaks more about your heart than about, uh, than about what the Bible actually says about it. So if you're not in a good Bible-believing church, you know what? Go visit some. Go online, check their mission statement, check some of their sermons, find out what they teach, check it against the Word of God, and then go sit in on some sermons. Get Talk to the pastor. You know, Find out uh, their mission statement, what they believe. There's nothing wrong with that, but do that so you can be part of a local congregation. So, this was the cliched expression that Christians shouldn't use. Uh, church is not a building. I get that church is not a building, but if you're using that expression to avoid going to a church congregation because you want to be a, a lone ranger, you want to be a rogue, or you just want to be all those things and then just go online and think you're your own church. Listen, that's not church. And on a side note, for a lot of people that are complaining about churches, there's going to be no perfect church until we get to glory. You notice all the epistles in the New Testament that are directed towards churches. All those churches had issues and problems and sins they needed to repent of. And that's the first century church. So don't think today you're going to go into a church and everything is going to be beautiful and it's going to be great. And there's not going to be any issues. You need to go to church anyway. And you know what? Nine times out of ten when people complain about, oh, the church doesn't do this, that, or the other, what they're saying is they're perfect and that church isn't. Well, you know what? You're not perfect. And then when you go into that church, you may find out that you may be part of the problem too. You need to check yourself. Because sometimes we can self-righteously judge churches and Matthew 7, 1 through 5 talks about self-righteousness. Jesus says, take what? The log out of your own eye. And sometimes we need to do that when it pertains to church. So, until we do another video in this series, remember something. People are going to, lead, are going to use cliched expressions a lot in and out of the church, saved and unsaved alike. What we want to do is check everything against the scriptures to make sure that it's true. If it's not true, we want to lovingly point out, I understand why you're using that cliched expression, but the whole of scripture actually speaks against it. And sometimes you can say something true, like this cliched expression, but use it in the wrong way. And we have to correct that thinking too. If you want to leave any comments or you have any questions or concerns, you can leave it in the comment section below. But as I say in other videos, please do not be snarky. Please do not be profane. We want to be Christ-like in everything we say and do. Until we do another video in this series, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And God bless.